this guy's doing. We don't like the policies he's setting. So we're going to have a little shareholders meeting. And we're going to remove that guy. We don't like him. We don't think he's operating everything that's in our best interests. So the shareholders, they're obligated to do it, yes. The directors are obligated to do what would be in the best interest of the shareholders. That's just a maxim of corporate law, period. Right? So the directors are appointed over here. Directors set policy. Every corporation has policy that it has to follow. And they do that to tell the employees what to do. The employees then in turn run the corporation by the policy set for them for the benefit of <coughs> the shareholders. And that's it. It doesn't get any more simple than that. So basically the government trust the director would be the queen and everyone in government would be the trustees? For government. Well, um, let's, well that, that's something else we'll touch in later today for the first time. We'll get into what the government trust is, because this is only one part. You've got to remember the government is another trust of its own that we interact with. So, so that's... In terms of the monetary system, now they borrow, they create bonds to create the money for the Bank of Canada. We can get into all that. Mm -hmm. so let's, set, let's stick with this for now, though. So we know that the directors who set policy, the employees who listen to them for the purpose of the benefit of the sole shareholder. Now we know that we, well, no, correct, we don't know that yet. So the sole shareholders appoint directors. So if I'm, or sorry, shareholders period appoint directors. So if I'm the shareholder, who am I going to appoint as a director? I usually would appoint myself. I can appoint anybody I want. Who else, could you trust? Who else could I trust? Exactly. Like I like to say, my grandfather always told me, if you want to do something, have something done right, you do it yourself. So I'm the director, director dean. And in trust law, you can be the director, you can be the executor and the beneficiary of an estate in the same capacity. The only one you can't be is a trustee in the same capacity. And that's where capacity comes in. You can be in a different capacity. So that's other stuff we have to touch on. But now we've got director dean. Now what's the only role left if government's a part of this equation? Government. Government. Trustees or employees would be government. So we'll just write, uh, we'll replace trustees with government. And they're all employees and they're limited liability, they're licensed and bonded in the whole nine yards and they're basically the trustees of the employee, the public employees of this corporation. Okay, so we know how this works now. That's the relationship. The director gives orders, the employees listen, it's done for the benefit of the shareholder who appoints the directors. And it just keeps going around. That's the holy trinity. That's where corporate law comes from. That's the original trust law that, uh, that they get into in the Bible with, uh, with God and the creation of the earth. Everything is all based on this model. It just depends on filling the roles with the appropriate individual for the purpose that, you're, that you've, uh, if you've entered into a contract with somebody uh, for any reason, it all comes down to who, what roles everybody's playing, right? And that's what's going on in court. And that's what I like to, we get into that later is everybody doesn't understand their role and what's going on here. The same way in a chess board, you know, you can't play chess unless you know the role of the pieces that are on the board. It doesn't matter what the piece is called. If you don't understand its role, what moves it's supposed to make, chess is going to be a very hard thing. So there's got to be order to all this, right? Um, I've talked before about the fact that because you're an investor in the, co in the government and the, you know, the government's got an obligation to you and you've got an obligation to it, I covered on that before about, uh, you know, people presume all sorts of things about, well, yeah, we're obligated to obey statutes because of that and the whole nine yards. No, absolutely we are not. Because if you want to use the word express trust for the legal person, that's what it really is. You're not liable to, to obey government statutes of any kind and we talk about that. Um, and the biggest reason being is that your, your part of this equation ends with your investment. That's your only obligation to the government was your investment. That's it. Unless anybody has ever seen an investor in Microsoft working on the assembly lines in Japan or China putting computer parts together. But, uh, being, uh, you have two places up there. Yep. Your shareholder yep. and the director. You've appointed yourself director. Oh, okay. So that's going to have, so that's going to have its own kind of liabilities attached to it, right? Right. So when you appoint 
apply for a social insurance number, you yep. can take up two of those positions, making who director then? Ah, no. When you apply for a social insurance number, what's happening is uh, the man is the sole shareholder, and that never changes. You could maybe even appoint somebody else a beneficiary. I really don't know. It's probably possible. But either way, you're the grantor or shareholder. You're the director. You're the one that gives direction to a legal person, right? To, to, to navigate it, to be the captain of the ship. Now, sometimes though, uh, you have uh, like Red Lobster or WestJet where you have the employees that are, now that are shareholders. And that's the same also if you look on a fishing ship, the employees, the, the crew have a little part They've got a share in what's going on. Yeah. That's true. Okay. So what government has done is, and we all know from, from reading statutes, if we don't all know, and I could probably find it real quick in the, uh, was it the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and I think it's specifically 32 and 52 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, if you go through it, we know that government statutes only apply to agents of the government. That's all it applies to, agents of the government. It doesn't apply to you. That's why they never violate your human rights. They're always very specific about what they do. So what government does, like summary convictions court, for instance, if they're trying to enforce a statute against you, what they've done is they've gone out and they've, uh, well, let's backtrack a little bit. Government has devised a way to get you to unknowingly contract with them that turns you into one of these employees down here. So you can be a trustee or an employee of your own legal person in a different capacity. So government has gone out and they've got you to come in and to apply for some kind of ID of some kind that's government issue like a driver's license, a social insurance number, some other benefit that gives you a nice little card, mantle, a liquor card, something. And what that ID does is identifies you as an agent of the government. So now you're operating in a different capacity, but you're liable for the capacity you're operating in as the man. You're always liable. It doesn't matter what capacity you're operating in, you're liable for it. Is that... Any one person or individual or anything? Yeah, it's a definition within the criminal code, um, so it's their definition. Yeah, right? exactly. But, but even their definition works in your favor as it means includes her majesty, majesty and an organization. Yeah, you're, you're not going to get anywhere with that, that argument in court, though. That's the problem. I've, I've seen everybody make these arguments in court. Okay, second, uh, when you go into court, you're operating, or they are operating under the presumption that you've already appointed them as director or administrator. Nope. <laughs> So what is going on in court? Now, okay, well, we'll get into that. So let's just understand that this is actually, this is the power structure. This is the important part. So once you understand the power structure, what we're going to get into later explains how to handle yourself in court and what's exa what exactly is going on in court. So the power structure is you're the investor. You're the shareholder. You are the uh, grantor and beneficiary of everything that is in the legal person. And that puts you in, in the seat of power because it's all yours. Right? Uh, question. Uh, only man can create value. Does that fit in there? Absolutely. Absolutely only man can create value. Everything that government has, they got from us. And that's another thing we can talk about sometime, and I usually do, is the fact that actually there, government cannot have a binding contract with you based on even one of the rules of, of contracting, which is uh, valuable consideration. What could government possibly give you that you don't already have? Because everything government has came from you in the first place. You've already got everything you need. You don't need anything from them. So no contract to identify you as a public servant could be binding in the first place. Right? I don't believe it could be. But I wouldn't even attack it from that angle. It gets a lot more simple than that. So the shareholder, you own everything. You've appointed a director. The director gives the marching orders to these guys down here, uh, the trustees, the government employees, and they perform. That doesn't mean you walk up to a cop on the street and you say, hey, you, I'm the director, you know, drop and give me 20 kind of thing. Like, no. Like, the, what they do is, um, and we'll get, into, we'll get into the other triangle that's going on here, too. We'll get into that later, because I think more, more people have court problems than anything, right? So what's going on in court? We know now that court, especially with summary convictions, is an internal tribunal for government employees, public servants. It's not binding on you at all. So the presumption when you walk into court is that you, that's why police, when they pull you over, what do they want to see? ID. ID. 
If you give them government issue ID, then it's identified you as an agent of the government. So the presumption now is you're performing some function of government. And if you're performing a function of government, you have to do what, you have to do what the government says because you're under the liability of the government now for being one of these guys. Because government's assumed all liability for their employees. Government can be sued if you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing when you're performing a function of government. So that's all the Criminal Code of Canada is, is a rule book for employees. And if you don't do what you're supposed to be doing, you're going to be penalized because the government's assumed liability for your actions. Which is what's being said in that uh, thing, that one line where it says anybody on this, because uh, anyone that's considered part of the government is technically part of the person of Her Majesty. You're part of the person. Hence, hence why exactly. you're included. And this is the reason why. Okay. When you walk into court, summary convictions, and they call the name of the legal person, they're not calling you. They're calling a hearing for the legal person, which is a corporation, no different than what a boardroom meeting would be or any kind of a, a formal hearing, a formal setting where records are being kept for the legal person. Right? And they really need you there because they're the one they, that they want to get to assume liability for everything that's going on because they just drafted a bunch of securities and stuff like that and they really need you to, you know, to, to, to take the live, yeah, to, yeah, to sign them and authorize them, and, right? So now the, the fact that we're the, uh, the, the, the grantor, the beneficiary, the sole shareholder and the director is irrelevant now because now we want to start dealing with what ha what's happening when you're in court. Um, so we got summary convictions. Um, so they call, they call the legal person and most people stand up and they start their arguments about I'm a man and this and that and everything else and, uh, or I'm an agent for the legal person, uh, whatever their argument's going to be. Okay, well, no one's disputing you're, you're not a man, first of all. They know you have human rights. The problem is if you are performing a function of government, which means you're licensed and bonded by the government and they're assuming liability for you, you have to do what they say. That's a liability issue. If you're not licensed and you're not, not bonded, you're not performing a function of government, then why would you have to answer to them? Right? So they have to trick you into thinking that you're a public servant, which is one of the three roles of your legal person. So you walk in there and you're saying, well, you know, I'm here regarding that matter. I'm, I'm, I'm here for that person, people have said, or I'm, I'm an agent for that person. Okay? You have to be an agent of that person to be in that courtroom to have standing. Everyone in that courtroom is an agent for the legal person for that particular instance. When, as soon as it's called, that's now a formal hearing for the legal person as of the minute they call that court case. Are you going to say something? Uh, again, the, the real, the real, but you can introduce another party into uh, the matter. Yeah. Would there be a, a, re a, a reason to, though? Uh, I like going in as a party intervener or a paramount security. Friend of the court, all that kind of stuff, yeah, but you're not going to be able to do any, you're, you're not going to have, um, I, I think your standing is vastly limited by that. And people should stop being scared of the name and start com controlling it, which is who they are, right? Assuming the, you know, you're the captain of the ship, you're the guy that owns all the cargo. That puts you in two fundamental positions of power regarding the legal person. So why why would you want to walk away from that and say, well, I'm just a third, you know, I'm I'm a friend of the court kind of thing, right? Well, because if you're not, not to, to do it further, but if, if you introduce yourself as I came in as the, param as the, uh, the representative of the Paramount Security Interest holder in the property of the, the person. Yeah. So at that point, I, it's no longer a sole shareholder. I'm coming in as beneficiary. Yeah, and, and again, yeah, and I've, I've, I've said that before, that when, when people go in and they become, they be, they're uh, there as the beneficiary, <coughs> judges have no problem with that. Right? Yeah, they're like, okay, well, you know, just sit back there and shut your mouth then because you're just the beneficiary. You have no say in anything that goes on here kind of thing, right? If you had a problem, you can always bring it up at a boardroom meeting later when you guys have a shareholders meeting and vote in a new director and do I like you're just you're just here to accept benefits or refuse them or do whatever, right? It's not a position of authority of any real kind that they recognize. Yes. So the judge is not assuming that position of authority. No. What the judge wants is the judge wants somebody who is a liable public servant. Liable. You're li so they need somebody to assume liability for the charges before the court. And they need, it has to be a public servant because that's all they can charge in the first place. That's why they need a driver's license, a social insurance number, any other form of ID when you get pulled over. And that's when, the law, that's when the realm of presumption starts to take over, right? And we've talked about presumptions before where it's just presumed you were acting as a public servant. Jurisdiction is presumed. They have